Hello and welcome to the first episode in a brand new series of This Racing Life, the show that brings you behind the scenes in the world of horse racing. This week we are in Newmarket ahead of the first classics of the season. However, there is a veritable feast of top class action to look forward to over the coming days, including of course the Punchestown Festival. And we will be speaking to leading trainers on both sides of the Irish Sea. Here's what you have to look forward to in this week's show. You know, we're lucky now through the support of some, some great owners to have some nice two-year-olds and um, I think, you know, it's just managing the expectations of the horses. Um, when they do win first time out, the dreams are of you know, immediately of Ascot and it's a very exciting time of the year to have horses like this and yeah, there must be parallels but, you know, I'm very much keeping sort of my feet on the ground at the moment and just every day is the next day and trying to find the next winner really. I try and get all our horses hopefully to last the full career, you know, till they're 11 and 12 and, and, and possibly even more running in these, these nice handicap chases. And we've got to look after them and, and not take unnecessary risks, which, which I, I, I feel means not running them on ground quicker than good, decent, decent jumping ground. Newmark has been here forever and all I can see is the improvement, but the people that are here, they don't necessarily see it on a day-to-day -day scale but now when I come back I appreciate it much more and you know the variety we can give horses and the type of things we do it, it is paramount you know and you have to be focused on that you have to you have to take what you've got and do the best with it and um, as I say I think it's a privilege for me and, and I'm very proud of being being a new market trainer again. I had a wonderful um, year you know and and Alpine Star winning a group with Coronation Stakes uh, first, out, first, time, first run of the season mm. was absolutely amazing. Like I wasn't over there, I'd sent, because I'd, I wasn't, at that stage I don't think even I was allowed to go racing in Ireland because I was too old. The 2000 Guineas were first run in 1809. They are the most famous and important eight furlong three-year-old contest in the world and lining up on Saturday will be the best three-year-old mile colts in Europe. Formerly an assistant to Gay Waterhouse and to Hugo Palmer, George Bowie acquired a training license himself in July 2019 and has been rapidly making a name for himself. It hasn't been without its speed bumps along the way, but um, we started with a handful of horses and you know they're they're flying at the moment and you know it came with its pressures last year. My my target was to have 10 winners and and we had 26. So you know, we needed to find the next horses to, to go on and, and you know, win their sequences. And, and it's great to have the two-year-olds up and running with a, with a nice, nice filly in Thunder Love at, at Kempton and, and obviously Force of Brazil winning at the Craven meeting. And you've got some great facilities here in the heart of Newmarket, which of course is the heart of flat racing as well. Is being a flat trainer and being in the flat world always something that you wanted to do or did it come slightly later in life? Uh, I think it would be unfair to say it was always what I wanted to do. Um, I think it was through my sort of teen years that it became more of a possibility. Um, but no, look, I, I come from Dorset, from a farming family, and you know we had two trainers, Richard and Nick Mitchell, that trained on our farm. So it was always sort of, it was always around, but um, I'd say, yeah, it was probably slightly later than, than some people. And your road here has taken you abroad. It's taken you to Australia, to Guy Waterhouse. Um, and to Hugo Palmer, as were you assistant trainer there for six years. How much do you think having those people supporting you as you were kind of coming into the business uh, helped you to get where you are today? Massively. Um, Hugo, well, obviously working for Gay when I left Newcastle University, was it was a great grounding. But I wasn't there very long, and you know I was very lucky that she showed me, you know, everything that she could in in a year. And um, I came back to work for Hugo and. And he, I think, you know, more than anything, was, is, a, is a great friend of mine now and, and you know, we speak every day. Um, he's, you know, he showed me everything that he could in the time that I was there and it was, and it was time to move on and he was incredibly supportive of that and has been ever since. Um, he let me run a yard of 50 horses for him for two years, which probably gave me the confidence to, to actually go on and do it myself. And it's not dissimilar to what we do now. You know, A.D. Rogers, who's my head lad, who was at Sir Michael Stout's and Henry Settles before, he, he came with me and we've got a great sort of team here and um, no, it's, it's going good. Do you think there are some parallels you can draw between how Hugo started and how you're starting? 
Probably, yes. Um, when I went to Hugo's, I remember vividly sitting down for a coffee with him across his table and he was declaring these two-year-olds as stars and that sort of thing. And, and they were, they were very good horses. Actabante won the Solario Stakes under Ryan Moore for Mr. Arachi and New Providences. And there were, there were some very good horses there. And, you know, we're lucky now through the support of some, some great owners to have some nice two-year-olds. And um, I think, you know, it's just managing the expectations of the horses. Um, when they do win first time out, the dreams immediately of Ascot. And it's a very exciting time of the year to have horses like this. And yeah, there must be parallels, but you know, I'm very much keeping sort of my feet on the ground at the moment and just every day is the next day and trying to find the next winner, really. And every day you do seem to be expanding very quickly. You moved to Saffron House, having not been here your entire time. Um, how much do you think being at Saffron House has helped you to expand? And is it where you want to be for the next few years? Or would you like to move on somewhere else as things continue to rapidly grow for you? I think it's, it's probably fair to say that we might have to move at some point. But at the moment, I'm very happy here. We've got a full yard of horses and, and some horses that with George Peckham just down the road and, and it works very well you know it's, it gives us the ability to have a bit of a change of scene for some of the horses and you know it's a it's a lovely spot here whereas you opened up with some of my sort of contemporary trainers Charlie Fellows and George Scott and I'm pretty sure Marco Bossi was here before and you know they train plenty of winners and, and some good horses from here so no I'm as I said very happy where we are at the moment but with more horses becomes you know, that we need to find stables for them and, and at some point we might need to move, but at the moment I'm very happy here. Three C's gave you your first ever winner at Lingfield. I imagine that was quite an emotional, special moment for you. You've now trained a winner at the Craven meeting in Forza, Brazil. Which one was the more special? Because obviously three C's being your first ever, but you're probably your biggest winner to date coming at the Craven meeting. I think probably three C's still. He was owned by... Um, 10 of my great mates um, and he was bought by Sam Haggis privately and it was one of those things where as I said earlier you know I, we had four horses when we started and he was rated 47 um, and it was a bit of a sort of proving that you know for me we'd had plenty of winners at Yellowstone when I was at Hugo's but actually doing it myself um, it's that realization that you know you can actually do it and you know we've had several two-year-olds that are one first time out so obviously Forza Brazil was it was great and he looks like he might be a cut above some of the two-year-olds at the moment um, but no three C's will always have a strong place in my heart we've actually retired him out in Moulton at the moment and um, he'll probably be back in to lead the babies in the winter. If you had to nominate a target or an aim possibly for this year or maybe for your career uh, what, would you, what would be the big one the next big one that you want to try and achieve? Uh, my targets at the start of this year were to have more winners than we had last year um, and we're, we're pretty close to that now so um, and the other aim was to try and have a stakes horse and and hopefully we can try and find a stakes winner I thought Miss G Angel was was going to do that very early in the year and and she didn't quite so we've we've had to slightly take stock but um, yeah to, it, my dream is to be training stakes horses and, and that's what it's all about really and um, if we could bump into a stakes horse or two this year it'd be great. Maybe even a Royal Ascot one. That's, that's the dream, yeah. There are few more capable national hunt trainers on either side of the Irish Sea than Venetia Williams, who can count a grand national success among her extensive catalogue of big race wins. She recently sat down with Jess Stafford to talk through the jump season so far. Do you see that there's a reason to, of, to be concerned about this rise of the Irish and how well they did and have you sort of reflected it on yourself and have some thoughts going forward? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's obviously a, a subject of much discussion um, mm. and uh, yeah, sure, I mean it, it, it's, 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 a, you know, it's, it's quite a challenge for all British trainers. Um, but at the end of the day, um, uh, I'd like to think that they're no better trainers than we are at, mm. at, as a group. Um, but it just so happens that this year that, you know, the, the, the nucleus of the best horses would seem to be there. And, and, and that's, you know, um, talking about the graded races. Mm. Um, I, I do think that um, the, the Irish horses are probably better handicapped than um, when they came over here. So, you know, I have to be delighted that um, we managed to, to get a second and third and fourth in, in the handicaps or, or, or um, virtually top weight or with mm. most of ours, of, of those three anyway. Um, Iblio um, 
you know, Cla Cloudy Glen and, and Cipage all ran, ran really well. Um, but uh, yeah, better brains than me will have their own ideas on how to um, address the situation and um, yeah, we'll see what develops. And there's, there's obviously a lot of talk about race planning, the way that they, their, their system into Cheltenham and that they also target Cheltenham. They want to come and win on our doorstep. Mm. For you, is Cheltenham a festival that you need to have runners in and do you want to have a winner in it every year or, or does it matter if it passes you by? Well, I mean, you know, the, the answer to that obviously is yes, yes and yes. You know, we, 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 that's, of course, what we all want to do. Um, you know, but, but it's important not to... to um, you know, forfeit your entire season for a chance mm. of, of being successful at Cheltenham because the chances are come the day you probably won't be anyway. Mm. You know, so, so the, there's, there's lots of good races to be won. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the most valuable handicap chase of Cheltenham Week was the Midlands National on the Saturday yeah. at Utoxeter. You know, so it, it's, you know, you've got to sort of kind of... Um, keep an eye on, on, on the, the bigger picture, I think. Yeah, and we've had a particularly wet winter as well, and when there is a bit of give in the ground and someone sees a Venetia Williams horse run, they put two and two together and they say, bingo. Um, <laughs> is this, your horse is running better in heavy conditions, do you think that's a bit of an old wives' tale? Is it something that you sort of embrace? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the old thing I've heard so many times, but um, at the end of the day, I... I uh, we don't have summer races um, anymore, and um, you know I've seen time and time again that that um, when you run horses on on good ground or or quicker, you know there's a much higher um, risk involved of, of tendon injuries. You know, and it, it's not difficult to to um, to to see the statistics that back that up. Um, you know, and. You know, I try, I try and get all our horses, hopefully, to last the full career, you know, mm. till they're 11 and 12 and, and, and possibly even more um, running in these, these nice handicap chases. And, you know, I, I, I don't have owners that can, you know, um, keep replacing and replacing their horses, you know. So we've got to look after them and, and not take unnecessary risks, which, which I, I, I feel means not running them on, on you know, ground quicker than good decent mm. decent jumping ground um so if my horses can't win on the winter ground of soft or heavy or whatever it may be that winter they ain't going to win anything because yeah. they're not going to have the chance to run on anything else yeah and they they're all a lot of the horses that you've purchased come from france that's where you've you you've had your most success are mm. you, do you do you look outside of that box are you buying more horses from the flat and 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 stores or is is france your your first and then you'll you'll kind of keep an eye eye, eye to the ground to, to other areas to buy too i think i think you know, like all good housewives, you know, one's <laughs> looking for value for money, yeah. you know, yeah. um, more for less. Uh, and that doesn't come into um, um, five for the price of three. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many different ways of, of, of sourcing horses. And, um, you know, hope comes at a price, mm. you know. So when you're buying stores, you know, there's massive hope because at, at the time that you buy them, they're all unbeaten. Yeah. You know, and and everybody's looking through rose-coloured spectacles. So um, until those horses, and, and it might well be two years subsequent to the drop of the hammer, that those stores, you know, are are, are being put to test, and and it's only then that you discover that such a small percentage of them are, are, are really the the good horses that you hoped you were buying in the first yeah. place, and. Um, uh, you know, I, I think if, if you can um, buy horses that have had some element of race course exposure, you know, whether it's point to points or, or um, racing in, in, in France, um, you know, racing in England is probably pretty re irrelevant because most horses in, in the UK are owned by the, the end owner, the owner mm. that wants to have that good horse. So, so very few of them, are, you know, you can buy anyway. Um, but I sooner buy something that, that you know, um, that he's got some element of ability and, and mm. I can hopefully see in in that potential for further improvement. Mm. Um, you know, but it's been well documented how how these um, Irish point-to-pointers have been so successful with so many better horses now going through the um, uh, the point-to-point -point fields. Um, you know, but it, 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 it's very hard to feel that, you know, I'm going to be able to get any value 
right under the noses of the Irish. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that applies to probably a lot of us, this side of the Irish water. Um, Do you think that the, the Irish point to point teams are licking their lips, thing, waiting for the, the English trainers coming over with big checkbooks and they're just sort of assuming that that's what's going to happen. It's for just sure. going to raise the prices. Well, it has, you know, and, and will continue to do so, you know, and, and supply and demand is, is, is the main, you know, basis for, for everything really. Mm. And, and um, you know, and, and it's great to know that there is, is a great demand for, um, you know, British jump racing. You know, there's a lot of people coming into it wanting to get in at a high level. Um, you know, and it's got to be good for the sport, and, 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 um, but it does make it very competitive. Sean Woods has recently returned to the training ranks in Newmarket after a highly successful and profitable spell overseas in Hong Kong, where he made £43 million in prize money and sent out 279 winners. Sean has recently moved into Shalfleet Stables, the impressive complex on Berry Road and hopes for more success after some recent juvenile winners. The reason I left uh, at the time was, you know, I was frustrated by the fact that we were producing good horses uh, for out of lesser lights and I was having to sell them uh, to bigger owners so that frustrated me a lot but the team I had was second to none. The people were, were genuinely there for me so uh, we used that and uh, in a way, it was the best decision of my life to go to Hong Kong financially, but um, also the worst decision of my life because I left something that I truly believe in. You know, uh, for me, it's not getting on a soapbox, but it, it, we do have the best racing in the world here. We have the breeding industry, we have the racing, we have the people. We just have to embrace everything and uh, try our hardest to put out that message. You know, look at the football now the chaos in it, it is because we have the best product and, and British racing has the best product so it's a privilege to be back. And results is one thing you didn't have to worry about when you were training in Newmarket all those years ago, winner of a Group 1, you had a Royal Lodge winner, um, that success was paramount and coming back now, is that the kind of same success that you want to try and strive for or are you even aiming even higher? Well, I've got to aim higher because this is sort of my last dance, you know, I'm 55, I've got 15, 20 good years of hard graft and hopefully pass this on to uh, one of my sons who, who would love to train as well. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll work hard at it and uh, what will be, will be. But, um, you know, we're trying to put everything in place where we can be as successful as we can and compete at the highest level, uh, whether that it's all relevant to the ability of the horses and specifically with this now we've kept the numbers down to build the team to put the infrastructure in and then to slowly come up um, we're lucky would you have any specific targets aims at the moment no just enjoy it and do the best i can we're 24 7 so this is a way of life for me i love it you know and um, it is what it is really one thing i did want to touch on is that when you're in hong kong earning all that prize money which is colossal over there Coming back to Newmarket and to Great Britain, it's quite a difference at the moment in terms of how much you can win in races. Is that something you think that's a bit of a problem and needs changing? Is it something that you're happy with? Or how, how do you feel about it? Uh, there are much wiser people than me that have been arguing about this for a long time. So um, I'll let them get on with that. But you know what I will say to everybody, sometimes you look at the other side, you do have to sell your soul. And, and it's a white elephant, you know, um, here, we have many ways of trying to increase revenue. If you have a good horse, you have a sale, resale value. If you have the ability to breed, you have that. If you're in, we are in an entertainment industry. That's where we need to get going with it. And we need to focus on trying to get the positive message out. Yes, prize money, the returns for owners, that's more important. Forget about the prize money for us. It's the return for the person who's investing. And the return comes from the experience. It comes from the future, it comes from the excitement, it comes from everything and the more we get that message over the better it is. The negativity, yes, I'm sure is the prize money and I haven't had to deal with that for a long time but it costs a lot of money to have these horses in training and once you ask people to invest like that we have to give them the whole package, the excitement, the entertainment, the value of what they're spending because these people will go and spend it on something else. 
you know, and everything's expensive. You know, you go abroad, you go on holiday, you have your own uh, excitement, that's something that brings you excitement, you know, it costs you money. So while it's costing them money, as a group, we should try to give them the best possible value for that. So it's the whole picture rather than just, just focusing on one negative. It's fascinating to hear you talk about the entertainment way of horse racing and the product. You therefore need a good product, don't you? And with that, you need the best facilities. And it's really quite remarkable to see how close you are to the Alba Hatchery Gallop, to Warren Hill, to all the facilities that are around Newmarket. Yeah. Um, I know that you've built a new road to the Heath for your horses. It's something that's really important to you to be that close, isn't it? It is. It's just about where we go and how we do it. Um, and also, um, you know, Newmark has been here forever and all I can see is the improvement but the people that are here they don't necessarily see it on a day-to-day -day scale but now when I come back I appreciate it much more and you know the variety we can give horses and the type of things we do it's, it is paramount you know and you have to be focused on that you have to you have to take what you've got and do the best with it and um, as I say I think it's a privilege for me and, and I'm very proud of being, being a new market trainer again. I mean, I have a photograph of 56 trainers. When I was a kid, you know, when I was 26, I was the youngest trainer in Newmarket, and we all were on the July course, and there were 56. I was great, the good and great. So Michael Stout, Henry Cecil, Julie, uh, people that were just phenomenal. And, you know, you aspire to be close to them, really. Prolific winners at the Cheltenham Festival and at Royal Ascot come alike to Jessica Harrington and few handlers in the history of the sport have enjoyed such success under both codes. Our Irish correspondent Don McLean recently went to visit the trainer for an update on her impressive squad of flat stars. Jessie, the season you had last year in the flat was fantastic, highlighted by your two Group 1 winners. It's, you know, look, it was great. It, it, it took a long time to get going and, and I promise you this time last year I was tearing my hair out. You know, because we had the horses ready, or so, most of them, you know, the, we were building up and we had the first day of the season at Nace and then we had lockdown. Mm -hmm. And the most frustrating about that, I kept on training, you know, we kept on ticking over with the horses, but we kept hearing, oh no, will be the 8th of May. Oh no, will be the time for the gu Irish Guineas. Oh no, and then we finally got D-Day, 8th of June. So um, I was slightly tearing my hair out and I did end up, luckily enough, that I had all the horses right by the 8th of June and we did hit, we hit the ground running, which was very lucky. But, you know, it, 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 it was, and I had had one runner in England, I'd sent Mill Isle over for the English guineas. Um, but other than that, we started then on the 8th of June and, and I was very, very lucky. I had a wonderful, I had a wonderful um, year, you know, and, and Alpine Star winning a group with Coronation Stakes, the, uh, first out, uh, first time, first run of the season mm. was absolutely amazing. Like I wasn't over there. I'd sent because I'd, I wasn't at that stage. I don't think even I was allowed to go racing in Ireland because I was too old. And so Richie went over, and um, and and as he said, I've never sat in. He, what did he say? I was sitting in the middle of Ascot, wait, you know, having got there in good time in the morning, waiting for the race. And he said I was watching Netflix. <laughs> I had nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been surreal. I mean, obviously, everything was surreal last yeah. year, but like, it must have been frustrating as well. Like, was it hard to keep the horses ticking over like that? Because as you say, that was her seasonal debut, going for a, a carnation yeah, stakes. Yeah, I, I don't know. We just, we would get sort of, we'd think it's going to start, so we better step up the rank, and then we'd drop back down again, and then we'd drop up, go up again. But, you know, it, it was, you know, I had, you know, between Shane and Kate and myself and Eamon, we discussed it all. Of what are we going to do? And should we do this? And should we do that? And and you couldn't take horses. I did get to go to the Curra, but there was a bit not easy. So I had to do everything here, you know, because they said, oh, you know, transport horses, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not like it is now. You know, we're allowed to go to the Curra. We can even do race course gallops and things like that this year, which even though we are in lockdown, they've sort of, it's been a lot easier and we haven't stopped racing. Yeah. Your juvenile colts from last year then, like Lucky Vega, obviously he was brilliant when he won the Phoenix Stakes. Yeah. Look, he's, he's going straight for the English Guineas. Whether he stays or not, I don't know. At least we'll know. But he's a very la relaxed horse. And so um, I think he, he could stay. 
because he, he definitely got whipped off his feet in the middle park, coming down the hill, yeah. and then stayed on again strongly up the hill. So you would imagine he gets seven anyway, but whether he, whether he will get the mile, I don't know. But, you know, if he's relaxed, which he is, he's every chance. Because he, he, he handled Newmarket well. I th he, he handled the dip well, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Oh, he did. He just got whipped off his feet. Yeah. Going, uh, he came down the hill as well as he could, but they just the, and, the other fella probably is an out and out sprinter. Yeah, but and and the two of them pulled nicely clear of, yeah. of the gym crack winner. So mm. you know it was probably yeah. a very good run. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a good. It was a good run, and you know he's he he's in very good form this year. Yeah. Very good. He's a, you know, and he's done very well over the winter. I think he's something like fifty kilos heavier than he was last year. Right. Yeah. No, you know, just... he's done well and he's developed. Yeah. He's done all the things you'd like him to do. Yeah. We, we just saw him there this morning, and he he looks good and um, yeah, strengthened up during the winter. Yeah. No, I'm very happy with him. This weekend sees the return of the Kipco Guineas Festival, featuring the first two classics of the season. Michael Prosser has been director of racing and clerk of the course at Newmarket for the past 20 years and has witnessed some of the best Guineas winners in recent history. Welcome to the Rolling Mile race course, the iconic uh, home of horse racing. And this weekend we have got so much to look forward to. The famous, prestigious Kipco Guineas Festival. The 2000 Guineas were first run in 1809. They are the most famous and important eight furlong three-year-old contest in the world and lining up on Saturday will be the best three-year-old mile colts in Europe. The Roly Mile itself, quite an idiosyncratic course, it is 10 furlongs long and the track will be laid out to be 33 meters wide at the eight furlong pole itself. It is an undulating course and balance and ability are two prerequisites for winning a race such as the 2000 Guineas. Here we are in the dip and the rise to the winning line from the one furlong pole to the winning post is four meters. If we look back up the hill you see the famous bushes in the background, five hawthorn bushes at the two and a half furlong point. At that point in a race the horses start to accelerate into the dip and it is absolutely critical that the horse stays balanced coming down before the rise they all peak at about 40 miles an hour coming down the hill itself. Famous winners of the 2000 guineas include Nijinsky, Brigadier Gerard, El Grand Signor but arguably the most famous winner of them all was Frankel in 2011 and who could forget how he destroyed the field from the front that day. One really key point to note on the day is the direction of the wind and the speed of the wind. And that information can be found by going to the Newmarket website. You'll find the link for our weather station. And you can monitor that constantly through the day itself. Last week at the Craven meeting, if you just look back at the races themselves, on the Tuesday, most of the winners came from the front. There happened to be a tailwind on that day. On the Wednesday, the wind turned around to be across the course largely. And the winners were generally shared between those, some from the front and some coming from behind. But on the Thursday, the wind became a headwind and most of the winners came from behind. The Craven ground is over there, railed off. What we'll be providing for the Guinness meeting is fresh ground. This piece of turf has not been raced upon since October last year. And although it's been a tough winter and we've had the coldest April since 2013, I am really pleased with the quality of the racing surface and the turf. We have so much to look forward to. We hope that you enjoy the racing on Saturday and most importantly, watch a little piece of racing history being made. Whatever wins the 2000 Guineas, the Kipco 2000 Guineas on Saturday, will be an extremely valuable asset. And in the future, as a stallion, will help to develop the breed, the thoroughbred, the horse that we all love and adore. Thank you very much. That's all we've got time for this week and thank you very much for watching. Make sure to tune into This Racing Life next week where Jess Stafford will be taking you behind the scenes in the world of horse racing.